from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, beginning with verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1, 18. Listen to the word of God. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the cleverness of the clever I will thwart. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and a folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. But God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Christ is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom, our righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, that he will boast, boast of the Lord. What a powerful word for us. Let us pray. O God, our Father, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto thee, O Lord, our strength, Lord thee. Amen. If you were in seminary, or if you were in college, or in high school, and if you were given the assignment to start a new religion, where would you begin? What would your new religion look like? Would there be a God? What would humanity's response be to your re new religion? What would your doctrine be? Would there be a concept of sin? Would man be the highest form of life, or would we just one blob in the great universe and galaxy? Would God? Would there be a creator God? Would there be angels and demons? Would Would there be a form of worship? And what type of worship would it be? And if there were evil, how would one overcome it? And if there was war, what would the cause of peace be? These are only some of the questions one would have to answer if one were to start a new religion. You know, during the French Revolution, the, the, the French uh, revolutionists started, wanted to start a new religion, and they weren't very successful. And then someone stood up and said, well, why don't you have someone die and rise again and see if that would start one? <laughs> you see, the question of modern man is whether or not man is a religious person. Are we homo religios? Are we religious people? Or are we just secular beings who have created religion? Is religion, as Freud put it, the figment of our imagination? Is it a future of an illusion? Or is it only wishful thinking for a loving father? The fact is there are many religions in the world. Each of them is, is associated with a founder who for good and evil wrote and, and inspired a holy book and instituted doctrines. Muhammad had a vision and dictated the Quran. Joseph Smith had a vision and, and wrote the Book of Mormon. Hindu scholars developed the Bhagavad Gita and Buddha inspired the Pali text. Religion is not only an old story, but there are new religions. Scientology was inspired by Ron Hubbard. Shirley MacLaine became a spokesman for the New Age movement. And there are secular religions, such as communism, that are inspired by the writings of Karl Marx and Lenin. And the new atheism of today is really a new form of religious quest for the meaning of life. If you were indeed to be the founder of a new religion, what would, you, what would your symbol of that new religion be? Would it be a star? Would it be the crescent of Islam? Would it be some symbol of your new religion? What would it be? There are those who, who want to mingle all the religions together. 
and you've probably seen bump bumper stickers where all the symbols of various religions and coexist, which kind of typifies how religion in the world is, you know, trying to just get along with one another. Well, you might say, well, you didn't mention the Old Testament or the New Testament. You didn't mention Moses. You didn't mention Jesus. And of course, you're correct because Judaism and Christianity represent the major influence on Western civilization as religions. All of our religion and all of our art and literature are influenced by the Christian faith and the imagery of the Bible. And the basis of Western civilization's view of man, of education, of our courts and secular uh, society might even reject it. But the fact is, they neglect it at their own expense. And they're ignorant of religion. Abraham Lincoln didn't say, as it said in the papers the other day, that the house divided against itself. That's what Jesus said. What we're maintaining today is that the Christian faith is not basically a religion. If one defines religion as man's attempt to find God, of course one can study Christianity as religion when one studies it sociologically. But essentially, that is a form of, of Christendom, which has little to do with the revelation of God in Jesus Christ as found in the New Testament. It is our belief that belief in Jesus Christ is not a religion, even though it takes on religious trappings, but indeed faith in Christ is not man's attempt to find God, but rather the Christian faith is understood only by the fact of revelation of God finding man. And the great fact of the Bible is that man cannot find God. And Isaiah said all of this many years ago. Listen to Isaiah. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span? Enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure and weighed the mountains and scales and hills in a balance. Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or as his counselor has instructed him? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are counted as the dust of the scales. To whom then will you liken God or what likeness compare with him? We as finite human beings really cannot comprehend God. All of our striving, all of our intellect really can't find God. The brothers and sisters, this is the basic thesis of the Bible. You can't find God, but rather God finds you. The Christian faith is not man's religion and man's attempt to find God, but God's attempt to find man. And you see, the Old Testament and the New Testament are God's revelation, not reason, but revelation to humanity of who He is. And it's a progressive revelation. First, God comes to, to the nation of Israel through Moses and the law. We just read the law. We read that from Exodus. And God reveals Himself to Moses and the people of Israel through the giving of the law. And listen then what it said following the giving of the Ten Commandments. Now when the people perceived the thundering and lightnings and the sound of the trumpet and the mountains smoking, the people were afraid and, and trembled and they stood afar off and they, they said to Moses, you speak for us and we'll hear, but let not God speak to us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to prove you and that the fear of him may be before your eyes that you may not sin. You see, this is the founding of the Jewish religion. Moses, the law, the tabernacle, the temple, all interpreted through the holy men and the prophets. This is what the Lord wants you to do. You see, God was preparing through Israel a revelation to all of humanity. But you know what the sad part is? Israel failed to really worship God, the prophet said, and they continued to sin. They continued to turn God's revelation into a religion. It worshipped the law and it failed to worship God. The prophets came and reminded them, Isaiah said, oh, you're trampling around in the courts of the temple. I don't want it. It, it, it disgusts me. It comes to my nostrils and I don't want it. So God looks down at humanity. Says the law is not going to save you. Religion is not going to save you. And God in his love says, you know what? I'll become one with them. I'll reveal myself as a human being. I'll become the Christ for Israel and all of humanity. And how does God then reveal himself? And this brings us to the lesson today from 1 Corinthians. God, God reveals himself as a suffering servant on a cross. On a cross. When we asked you at the beginning, if, if you were to start a religion, how would you start it? What symbol 
problem would you have for a new religion? Would you take the most cruel form of execution and make it the symbol of your religion? What is the prevalent form of execution today? Is it not the electric chair? Would you make the electric chair or poison-filled syringe your religious symbol? Could you sing in the electric chair of Christ thy glory? Could you sing when I shall lay in the wondrous electric chair on which the Prince of Glory died? Could you sing at the electric chair, at the electric chair where I first saw the light, all the burdens of my heart rolled away? Would women wear little electric chairs made of diamonds around their necks? Would we put electric chairs on the steeples of our churches? Mm. Well, do you know that's exactly what Scripture tells us happened? Cursed is he who hangs on a tree. The symbol of great tragedy and great evil and great death became the symbols of the followers of Jesus Christ. It was a shock and it became a folly to the philosophers. That's not how we start a religion. That can't be how the God we worship. No, we, we want to hear of little birds and doves and sweet music. Don't talk to us about execution, about death, about electric chairs and poisons and needles. Talk to us about love and peace, but don't talk to us about a cross. That's what the Jews, Jews and Greeks were telling the early Christians and Paul. The fact is, the cross of Christ become, became offensive to the Jews and to the Greeks. They represented two forms of religion. The religion of miracles and the religion of wisdom. The Jews wanted a warrior on a white stallion to come and kill the Romans and use the sword and show miracles. And the Greeks and their philosophers, they wanted wisdom and reason and intellect, a, a religion of the wise. And so the Apostle Paul, the great preacher of the cross, comes into this situation and says, no, you're all wrong. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. We need to be reminded again and again that the core of the Christian faith, the core of all preaching, is the cross of Christ. The earliest proclamation of what we call the kerygma is that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. Christ died for our sins. And indeed, the gospels, one could say, are really the story of the passion of Christ with a long introduction. In John 1 29, right at the beginning of the gospel, we hear these words, what? Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. We just sang, O Lamb of God. Indeed, the cross is the center of the faith. If you take away the cross, you take away the core of the gospel, which is the Christian faith. And I wonder today that the church is dying. In the 20th century, there was a movement to take out all the cross and all the blood out of the hymns. We're preaching about everything today, about peace and justice and reconciliation and joy and feeding the poor and all that. And yes, and all of these are consequences but the core message, the core message of the gospel is that these are only relevant because of the cross of Christ. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all humanity to myself. Christ is telling us that his lifting up on the cross, his dying for all humanity, that's why he came. If you deny this, you deny the Christian faith. And so the cross became an offense to the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews wanted a miracle worker. Just like they saw smoke on the mountains and lightning and thunder when, when the law was given to Moses. That's the kind of Messiah they wanted. And the Greeks wanted philosophers. They wanted wise men. They, they had Socrates and, and Plato. What more did they need? And the Apostle Paul enters this debate and challenges all of man's academic and intellectual ability by stating four different questions. Where is your wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? It's an important question that God confronts everyone of us or every day, particularly those in academia. I remember when Dr. George Buttrick, the great preacher to Harvard University Memorial Church, he reprimanded all the professors and students one day. He says, yeah, you think you can dig up Veritas in Harvard Yard, don't you? You think you can dig up the cross in Harvard, or you can dig up truth in Harvard Yard? No. Let me tell you, the truth is Jesus Christ and his cross. After World War 
One and World War Two, and after Vietnam, and after the killing fields of Cambodia, and after Iraq and Afghanistan, humankind still thinks that somehow if we try a little better and a little harder, we can have peace in the world. But the cross remains a condemnation to all of humanity's philosophies and attempts to find God. The cross is a judgment on all of our thoughts, all of our striving, all of our man-made attempts to find God. God reveals to us in Jesus Christ the only way of finding Him. It is through the cross of Christ. That's what the Christian faith is all about. Professor Lin Yutang was a great Confucian scholar at Columbia University. He was converted in Madison Avenue Presbyterian Church in New York City. He saw, in all of his study of philosophy, suddenly he saw the futility of all of man's wisdom. And he said he called it the age, the 20th century said it was the age of destruction. Picasso dis dissected the material world with as much pleasure as a naughty boy. Stravinsky laughed at harmony. Gertrude Stein destroyed grammar. E.E. E. Cummings destroyed punctuation. Lenin destroyed democracy. Joyce destroyed idiom and Dolly destroyed sanity. Freud played a curious role in the general destruction. He established his laboratory in the toilet and was able to analyze a number of things about man. Indeed, this is a critique of the wisdom of modern man. Have we come any farther in our attempt to find God without Christ? To live the beautiful life without eternity? I think not. We are as hopeless and helpless as during the Apostle Paul's day. You know that every time you turn on television. That's why Paul reminds us that all of human wisdom is itself folly, which leads to destruction. It leads to our perishing. It leads to frustration. Like Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and, and all the king's men couldn't put him get back together again, could they? And that scripture says it's our human problem. That's your problem and my problem. And that's the end of all of our wisdom. You call the cross folly, but indeed your wisdom is folly. It leads to destruction and death. That's what Apostle Paul is saying to the Greeks and the Jews and to us today. And so having shown the wisdom of this world to be incapable of reaching God, and having shown that man's wisdom is really folly, now the Apostle Paul confronts us with the cross as the wisdom of God. You know, much of the great scholarly debate today centers around a, a term that they call the paradigm shift. A paradigm is a way of thinking that gives meaning to life. It's a story, it's a narrative. And in a sense, one could say that all of the religions of the world are different paradigms or different stories attempting to give meaning to life. The religion of the Jews, Paul says, demanded signs and wonders. That was their paradigm. The religion of the Greeks and Gentiles demanded intellectual vigor and rigorous thought and philosophy. But both failed, the apostle tells us. Therefore, God in his wisdom confounds all human wisdom with the wisdom of the cross. And it's a stumbling block to both forms of religion. That is, religion as reason and religion as signs and wonders. The cross is a stumbling block for all humanity. And this is where your redemption, though, and my redemption is assured. To those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, the cross of Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. What, what an amazing revelation. The cross is the power and the wisdom of God. If you want wisdom, you've got to come to the cross. If you want power, you've got to come to the cross. You see, Paul is analyzing the religions and philosophies of his day and really our day. Both want power and wisdom. We all want power. We all want wisdom. Power to heal. Power to see vision. Power to experience the divine. We want wisdom to understand what's happening. We want wisdom to make the right decisions. We want wisdom to triumph over our enemies. In a sense, one could say all of human achievements have been an attempt to succeed by triumphing and controlling the other's wisdom and power. But all such attempts of humanity fail. All of our striving becomes losing unless we see the cross as divine wisdom and divine power. Many governments have tried to destroy the cross. Remember, remember Khrushchev? He said one day he's looking forward to the day when the last Christian can be shown on Soviet television. <coughs> Where's Khrushchev today? He's dead. 
and the church is blooming and blossoming in Russia. I wish you could see in Moscow, we have one church of the communists today, there's 53 Baptist churches filled and packed with people and young people. Many governments have tried to destroy the cross, haven't they? Hitler was going to do away with the church, where is he? The lonely dictator, evil man who died in a bunker. The East Germans, communists, built a huge TV tower in East Berlin. They wanted to show the power of their government. And they, and, and they built it with mirrors and glass. But you know what happened? The mirrors and the glass formed a cross. And all day long, the cross of Christ stood over Berlin and all over Germany. <laughs> the cranes and construction crew formed a cross. When a typhoon destroyed Macau near Hong Kong, the governor of Bowery took a ship to view the destruction. And when he arrived in the port, the only thing that was left standing was the facade of a church with a cross on top. He was so moved by this, he took out his pen and he wrote in the cross of Christ, I glory, towering o'er the wrecks of time. All the light of sacred story gathers round its head sublime. When the woes of life o'ertake me, hopes deceive and fears annoy. Never, never shall the cross forsake me, Lord glows with peace and joy. We are reminded again and again by Scripture that we cannot boast in our human achievement. But if we're to boast, it's to boast only in the cross of Christ. And that's why Paul reminds the Corinthians, he reminds us that the message of the cross is first to the poor and the downtrodden. Why? They understood God's revelation. Listen, listen to this again. For consider your call. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not to bring to, to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Don't boast of your achievements. Boast only in the cross. And the great paradigm shift of the cross means that now we are not saved by our religious fervor, not by our powerful experiences, not by our intellect, but we're saved by God's grace in the cross of Christ. And for at the cross we're all the same, in need of forgiveness, in need of redemption, in need of revelation. When we get to heaven, we can't boast of all of our achievements or good works. Probably the greatest theologian of the 20th century was Karl Barth, and the night before he died, he called his, his friend, Professor Edvard Tornais, and he said, Edvard, when I get to heaven, it's not because I wrote, uh, I'm not going to say the same thing, I wrote 20 volumes on theology. It's only because of the cross and the blood of Christ. Mm. Nothing in my hands. I bring solely to thy cross I claim. Can you say that? This should be our song for all of eternity. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. His religion couldn't save him, but he needed to be born from above by the Holy Spirit. You see, that's what Christ does for us on the cross. I remember being with Billy Graham in Poland. He was about to speak at the Catholic faculty of Warsaw, Poland. And there's good relations between the Baptists and Catholics. And, and before Billy Graham spoke to the 600 priests, the dean of the faculty stood up and walked and said, just a second, Billy, I gotta give my testimony. He said, I was riding on a bus in Chicago, I was studying at the University of Chicago. An old, an old African-American lady was sitting behind me and she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, are you saved? And he said, well, don't you see my collar? I'm a priest. She said, never mind. Are you born again? <laughs> <laughs> and the dean then related how he went to his room and he got the Gospel of John and read again in John 3, where Jesus said, you must be born again. And he rededicated his life to Christ and now he's dean of the faculty. You see, the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved is power and wisdom so much more. Let, let, listen again to the words of Scripture. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God has made our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, not all the good little works you do. You see, this is Paul's conclusion to the word of the cross. In the cross of Christ we find life, 
In the cross of Christ we find our wisdom. In the cross of Christ we find our righteousness. In the cross of Christ we find our sanctification. You're not going to be sanctified by all the little good works. You're going to be sanctified because of the cross of Christ. You and all of humanity need a new paradigm. We need a new story that gives meaning to life. And the cross of Christ is the story that gives life and joy and wisdom and forgiveness. And that's why we sing, tell me the story of Jesus. Right on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. All of you this morning are invited to this holy table. Not because you're good. Not because you're wise. Not because you've had a religious experience. You're, you're invited because Jesus Christ died for you. Jesus loves you. He wants you to be part of his family. You're invited to this holy table if, if you accept that Jesus Christ is your personal Lord and Savior. And, and, and that's God's invitation to you. Maybe when you come to the Lord's table, as the Apostle Paul said, you have to ask yourself, do I have something against my neighbor? Is there someone that I haven't forgiven? Do I have bitterness in my heart? Is there anger? Is there something I need to forgive? That's why we have this invitation. That's why we ask the deacons to come forward now. The deacons come forward right now. Give them an opportunity to, to pray. Maybe you want to go to somebody and say, please forgive me, as well. That's the invitation of Christ to each of you. This table. I died for you. I love you. I want you to be part of my kingdom. Not through religious experiences, not through rationalism, but through the cross of Christ. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, you know the hearts of every person here. You know that we all need forgiveness and confession. If there's someone here who's not accepted you as their Lord and Savior, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be with them and speak to them today. Give all of us the courage to forgive and to love. Send your Spirit to us, we pray. Bind us together, if we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.